Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 781 News. Uh, this week, we are going to go over the MBTA's Communities Act. Uh, we have the uh, the plan is publicly available, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that plan um, and how it was brought up in the Ward 7 community meeting. Um, and then we'll be going over the committees. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the Ordinance and Rules Committee, the Economic development meeting uh, that has to do with rats as well as well as the committee of the whole that goes over the RFPs uh, for the Beaver Street Field Station as well as 90 Felton Street. Um, I believe that's it. Uh, this week I'm joined by Josh Castor. Hello. And James Free Kelly. Hello everyone. Um, so yeah we're going to talk a little bit about the MBTA Communities Act. Uh, which we've talked about extensively on the show. Um, it, it was actually brought up in the Ward 7 meeting, um, which happened uh, this week. The meeting happened uh, the same night that the mayor's plans became publicly available. Um, and so we were curious if, uh, if, the, if, if anyone was going to bring up the, that plan, and someone did. Um, and so the mayor talked a little bit about how she had... Uh, submitted a plan and the city wasn't losing a uh, shitload of money. Um, and uh, just a sidebar, uh, we're not going to talk about the Ward 7 meeting uh, itself, what Paul had to say uh, at all very much. Uh, we did record uh, that meeting. We were the only one that did record that meeting. So if you'd like to do that, uh, if you'd like to watch it, I thought it was very interesting seeing what Paul thought of Ward 7 and Waltham. Um, just a funny anecdote uh, that I could not pass up sharing was that at the beginning of the meeting, he said that he was inspired by Michelle Wu's State of the Union address. He wasn't planning on talking at all, but he was inspired. And so that he would take the first 15 or 20 minutes uh, verbatim, that's what he said, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Ward 7, and then it would be a fireside chat, uh, his words. And then he spoke for 50 minutes exactly 50 minutes of a, of a captive audience just just listening to Paul Cates and I mean we're not, I don't really want, I don't really want to get into me disagreeing with things he had to say but that can cover we can talk about that another time but I just thought it was hilarious that we held us all captive for 50 minutes before anyone could say anything but um so the mayor says that she submits a plan and we uh some some of the people um doing things in Waltham had already uh, acquired the plan um, because the state uh, released it to us. Um, and so we had already started perusing it. And Josh did a good deep dive into it, um, more detail oriented than me to give a better synopsis. So uh, Josh, if you wanna chat a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. So um, this was, so the deadline was the 31st and people, some citizens, there was a, a Reddit thread about it. And some people said that they had called in on the 31st and were told the mayor was working on it. Um, so uh, the next day we waited to hear and the state actually confirmed and there was a Boston Art Globe article that confirmed that they did receive it from Waltham. And the mayor's comments at that meeting, at the Ward 7 meeting, she, the, I can't summarize her whole thing, but she seemed to think this is still up for negotiation. She said one size doesn't fit all. And she talked about how she's pushing back on the state requirements. So I wanted to take a closer look at that. Let me just share my screen. So um, the as we've talked about before, MAK communities law is a state law. It was passed, it was a bipartisan law that passed with broad support in the legislature and was signed by Governor Baker. Um, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, it was then their job to um, enforce the law. And they had a period of public review where people could make comments on how they were planning to enforce the law. And then that ended and they put out final guidelines these are the, their final guidelines I'm showing here. Um, so what the law says in the text of the law is that um, every uh, MBTA community has to have a district that's within um, half a mile of the T and allows for a certain density of housing. And this is not special housing like you apply for. This is just housing that's available to everyone. Um, and one of the most important things to understand about this is 
the law does not require the city to build anything. And that's going to come up a lot, I think, in the discussions about this. What the law requires is that the city get rid of zoning laws that are preventing developers from building this. So in some ways, it's like, you could say it's a really progressive law because it's a very um, uh, aggressive approach to the housing crisis. But if it was a progressive law, you might expect that there's some kind of mechanism to cap the prices on those units. And there's not. Instead, um, they are trusting the law of supply and demand. Um, there, are, the idea is if you build market uh, a large amount of market rate um, housing, multifamily housing, in or if you zone, if you take away the restrictions that are preventing uh, developers from building these things, then the market will dictate that they build them, and then by the law of supply and demand, housing prices will go down for everyone. Um, so people who believe strongly in free markets should actually really like this law. This is a very Adam Smith kind of approach to housing, and it's very different from what how the city has approached housing in the past, which I think is kind of the point. The legislature wants to make a big change to how we deal with this, and um, uh, so it's not business as usual. Um, if you think about it, a single family zone is not a free market, right? It's saying what the single family zoning is saying that if you own a piece of land, you can't build what you want to build. That's going to make the most money. You have to build what our local government says is the best for the community. And if you think about it that way, conservatives really should be against single family, or at least libertarians, let's say, should be against single family zoning. But that's not always true at the local level. And um, people who believe strongly in free markets should like this law because it's a law that puts a lot of faith in the market to help fix the problem. So you saw that in the text of the law, it's the half mile um, from the T thing and the density component are both in the text of the law. What the State Department um, had to uh, the only part that was really up for them to interpret was what is a reasonable size um, com district. The law says that every city has to have a reasonable size district. Um, so what does that mean? And what they came up with is a very complicated formula that um, treated different types of communities differently. But in the case of Waltham, it was actually pretty simple. It's based on the number of units we already have, and um, it's 15% of that. It's 15% of what we already have. And that's a goal number. And the other thing that's important to understand is it doesn't require, uh, it gives us a, a goal number, but it doesn't require us to build. That's not the goal for new units. That's a goal for total units. So our goal is 3,982, but some of the units we already have count towards that. So here, um, and this is the supplemental materials. Let me show the form first. So this is the form that got submitted. As you can see, it says on a lot of places, um, see supplemental responses. So a lot of the info is in the other document, but it says the team of people who's working on this, the state provided tools online like GIS maps and an Excel spreadsheet that, that officials could use to model different solutions to this, different zoning solutions. Um, and so it says there's a team working on this in city hall. And maybe the most important part here is it says they're trying to have it ready for the city council to hold sessions on it um, in June and September. So so that's that's uh, that would be great if they could get it done um, that soon. That that I don't know. We'll see how realistic that is. So here is the supplemental materials. Um, it's about twenty pages, and it answers some of the questions from the form in more depth. Um, and so it says that um, it calculates that. Currently, um, we need to build about five hundred twenty-five additional units. Um, to meet the goal. So we don't need to build 3,000 something, we need to build in the hundreds to get up to that number. However, at another place, it says, um, it acknowledges that some of the units they were counting in that 500 actually don't apply because they're in a zone that doesn't have the right um, density. So actually they say, and they're sort of asking if, um, the state could maybe allow that as an exception. There are several places in this document where they seem to be asking the, the state to make exceptions. And so they said, if they can't count those units, then it's actually 800 we have to add. Um, they also note that there is, 
a zone that currently um, near Brandeis that allows for, um, wait, is Carter Street the one near Brandeis? Yes. Carter Street is the by is the seventy bus stop at the at um, the Waltham Center. By the, oh, got it. Okay. Station. So they said that. Um, so, for instance, here it's saying that near there, there is a zone that always already allows for dense zoning, but that's about five hundred feet outside of the half mile. So they seem to be suggesting, well, if you allowed us to count that in our total, that would make it a lot easier. Um, there's a. Uh, section here where it gives the history, um, which is something it asked for on the form. And the history basically talks about things the mayor's done to improve housing and transit in the city. And it also sort of implies ways that the state has not been helpful. So it seems to be making the case that Waltham is, you know, Waltham's already working so hard to provide affordable housing and the state is not being helpful. Um, in here it says current transportation projects and it gives things she's already working on one of them is a monorail it notes that the mayor has been um, pushing for a monorail on route 128 um so then there's this section called new city projects where it doesn't talk about projects it sort of uh gives um and this seems like maybe the mayor wrote it herself it sounds like her voice because she said this in her comments at the ward 7 meeting too we believe that one size does not fit all which is, I think, is an odd way to describe this law because they literally they came up with a different number for every town, and they came up with a different formula for every type of town. So there isn't really a one size fits all here. What she's really saying is this doesn't work for Waltham. Um, there, she's asking if the city will allow um, us to count units that are near the Fitchburg line but not within the half mile. She also points out that Waltham market rate housing is actually luxury housing. And that's that's true in the short term. If you if you take away the zoning, what in the short term, what the what the developers are going to want to do is luxury housing. But the idea is that if everybody takes away the zoning, then the housing prices will come down. So what she's saying here about market rate housing is actually luxury housing. That's kind of true, but it's the, the legislature knew that and they wanted to do this approach anyways. The whole idea is to do a free market approach. So um, this is uh, the analysis from the law department. It says it should be noted that while Waltham currently has a large number of multifamily units already existing, for the most part, these multifamily units do not qualify under DHCD's requirement for inclusion. Um, because they don't have the density. The zoning uh, has requires a density of less than 15 units per acre, and that's the limit that's in the law. So they seem to be implying that if the regulators were to change this, it would make it easier for us to comply, but that that's in the law. I don't think that's a matter of interpretation. It also says in the legal analysis, this model is disparate in its impact with regards to cities which already have many faulty family units and other communities that do not not already have multifamily units. Well, that's true. It has different requirements for both. But is that an unfair discrepancy? It depends on what your attitude as to whether this amount of housing is going to be good or bad for the town. Um, and that's a, a, a value judgment. And it seems to think it seems like the legislature thinks, yes, it is going to be good. So it's not damaging us to be requiring this. One thing that jumped out at me too with this requirement that they're that they had here, basically they're trying to say that they want to have zoning that they have outside of the immediate commuter rail stations count towards the limit, mm -hmm. and we count we count as a commuter rail city, not a bus commuter city, for the purpose of this thing, and a bus commuter city would have a higher number of units required. <laughs> So they're trying to have it both ways, where they have the lower number of units required, but then be able to count things that aren't on the commuter rail towards it. It's a very convenient kind of mindset that they have. Yeah, yeah. And my understanding is we're considered a commuter railroad community, even though we have buses, because during that comment period, somebody made the case that we were not really a bus community because we don't have good enough bus service. So to then, yeah, it's to bring up the bus service. And this is kind of odd. And it's not um, like the city's building bus bus lanes or anything to have better bus service. They're right. taking basically no effort. They had to fight to get a bus like shelters like put up, and they only give you that one anywhere. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, and in the history section, it notes that MBTA has reduced service, 
um, kind of making this point that the state, you know, we're doing a lot for housing and transportation, the state's doing nothing. So who are they to tell us that we have to change our zoning? That seems to be the point that the mayor is trying to make here. Um, in this, this part, it says that, well, this zone meets the density requirement is located along the Fitchburg commuter rail line. It is not located within half mile of the commuter rail station, but is within half mile of the rail line itself. So they in seem to be suggesting on. <laughs> that the state should allow them to count that because it's in half a mile from the track. Okay, so you can actually go to a railroad track and hail down a train to stop wherever you want. Trains don't work that way. So I thought this is a particularly silly argument. There are some better arguments in here for why this doesn't work, but I thought that's silly to say you should allow us to do within half mile of the actual tracks because that doesn't make any sense. Um, I mean, they have to I know. This is just like insulting almost. <laughs> Um, it also notes that the mat that there's a, a plan in place with the master plan committee that they're going to be meeting about this. They're going to have a zoning consultant, and so that's it'll be the master plan committee that comes up with a plan to bring this forward to um, the city council, and that what they'll vote on. Down here, there's another section, other feedback regarding the compliance process, which they did ask for on the form, but it's just funny because there's there's more editorializing here. Um, it's unclear why existing units within an area, even though they may be non-conforming, are not to be counted. If a multifamily unit exists as a non-conforming use and it has a legal right to remain in existence. So basically what she's saying is that this law is going to force you to get rid of houses that exist under the old zoning, which is totally silly. It doesn't do anything to existing houses. And, and also all these existing units are out of compliance with our existing zoning because they don't have enough setback and space for cars. So like it, it, it's it, it's not like these units got knocked down because they were out of compliance with that zoning. So the odds are they're probably not necessarily going to get knocked down immediately because of a new zoning that they'd be out of that they might be out of compliance with, with too. So yeah, I don't know what it means about the house's legal right to exist. Um, yeah, and that's another problem you kind of touched on. That's something that they raise is that a lot of our affordable housing is done on a special permit, was built on a special permit. So it doesn't count towards this because this has to be by right. That's what the legislature said. We have to make the zoning rules so people can do just build without having to get a special permit. And that's yeah, why- This is again, them getting their own way so much that they have ended up in a situation where now they can't get their own way. and the state is saying that they have to allow these units to just get built if they're going to, if they need to get built or if they could, if it makes sense to build them. So I thought this was a very, and I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I don't think this is usually how a municipality responds to a state regulator asking for reassurance that we're following the law. This document is not about that. This document is about making the case that the law is unreasonable. Um, it does say that we have a plan in place to follow it, um, but it spends a lot more time talking about the problems on the plan. And so I guess the question is, does the mayor really think this is still a negotiation? Um, the state agency said this was their final comment. So why is she still talking about it as if it's up for negotiation? Um, one possibility is that she doesn't, but she just, you know, this is, she wants the public to see that she's fighting this every step of the way. So then at some point in the future, if people hear that the city council is changing the zoning to allow a lot more units and people don't have context, there could be a backlash to that. So I think she wants to be able to say, well, the state made us do this and I fought it every step of the way. That might be it. It also could be that she's thinking that if the state does not comply and I mean, if the city does not comply and the state takes away money, we could end up in court with the state making the case that this agency acted um, arbitrary and capriciously in how it interpreted this law, that it, it um, exercised power that the law didn't give it. Um, I think that we would not have a case because so much of their requirements are written into the law. And the only part that's a matter of interpretation is those numbers, those goal numbers. Um, but also, uh, to say, yeah, it, they had, we, and obviously uh, the mayor does not agree with their process, but they did have a process. So to go to court and try to claim that this is an unfair law, I don't think um, Waltham would have a very good case. I'm not a lawyer though. 
I, I, I mean, I'm I'm not either. But like, if you just like look at their actions, right, you can see that they it's not really a high priority. And like, if you just like look at like the uh the, like the CPA fund spending and how it's like, you know, there's like a minimum amount that it has to get spent on housing, and miraculously they always spend just about the minimum amount on it <laughs> if they can get away with it. And it. It, it, it strikes me that it's gonna be difficult for them to make the case that like they really just care too much about like housing that they they need to have special allowances made for our situation we're in the same situation that everyone else is in yeah i mean the one size fits all thing doesn't as an argument just doesn't come through here because they didn't do a one size fit all um and really what we're arguing is is that this law isn't good for us because this isn't how we deal with housing but that's kind of the point. The um, you know the the accomplishments that the mayor has listed in terms of increasing housing, there are things like twenty units here, two units there, ten units there, and there will have some kind of restriction on them. Um, and so the way that the city has approached housing so far, I think, is is kind of treating it like charity, like like it's not really our problem to solve but we're going to help out with the problem to be to to be nice and it helps out the people who end up in those affordable units but it doesn't address the underlying problem of the housing crisis and so i thought that it seemed like the intent of this law was the legislature to say no more doing things the way we've done them in the past we have to do things in a way that will actually address the problem and they believe that the free market can do that as long as we take away all all the restrictions on developers on the subject of not actually addressing the problem right and cpa funds like most like a lot i didn't realize exactly how much cpa funds were getting spent on like subsidies to landlords throughout the like last few years but i mean considering the, 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 to make a oh. new chart actually that, that one's up to 2020 and up to 2020 the cpc had in its total history had spent a very small amount of its money on housing and none of it was create or to create new housing it was either repairing existing housing or it was rental assistance to keep people from getting evicted during the pandemic which is great but that's a payout to landlords 100 percent of that money ends up in the hands of landlords and then i remember when they uh took away the eviction moratorium um as in the pandemic then people were saying well who what about the poor landlords who you know they're going to get screwed if they can't evict people but meanwhile the landlords were getting paid like they they were the getting time all the, all, the, all the rental assistance that went to tenants went straight to the landlord. Um, so yeah, so Waltham does not have a tr good track record on building new affordable housing. The things that the mayor is pointing out here are exceptions to the rule and exceptions to the rule aren't gonna fix our housing crisis. It's kind of like I was thinking about it, like we're talking about complying with the law, right? And, it, and maybe that means something different when it's an institution doing it versus an individual. But I think like if someone in the public eye in Waltham got arrested and charged with a crime and we interviewed them and they, we said, so what's up? Did you actually break the law? And they said, well, first of all, you have to understand it's a stupid law. <laughs> Second, you have to understand that the, I don't like how the, the police enforced it. I thought they were rude and they weren't professional. That would not be a good answer, right? I think the mayor and most people in town would not be sympathetic with that. If you're not, if you're breaking the law, you're not in a good position to criticize the law or criticize the enforcement mechanism. And that's kind of what the what the um, the mayor's doing. She hasn't broken the law so far, but she's doing every she's setting the stage to try to avoid complying with the law and and escape accountability while doing so, like acting as if she's doing everything she can and. It's 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 interesting too because she always tries to characterize it every time she talks about it as the state taking money away from poor families and like again if you're going to, not to belabor the CPA funds but like if that's money that's set aside to be making affordable housing for people and most of that money is then going to non permanent solutions rather than actually like taking concrete steps to improve the situation for people and like you know that money could be getting spent on social housing if they actually really cared as much as they profess to like it just isn't and instead like non-solutions get presented as wonderful charity that they should be thanked for instead of just like scraps getting cast off to people so thank you josh and james for that detailed description i know people were curious about uh 
our plan or lack thereof. Um, going to keep a close eye on that. Uh, something else that came out of the um, the plan itself was the revelation that the master plan committee was going to be meeting. It did say that in the plan. And so people are speculating that that's the last citywide uh, meeting that they're talking about, um, unless it's actually talking about just a master plan actually meeting, which would be very curious because it has not met once in its entire inception. Moving on to the city council committee meetings that happened this week. Uh, most of them met, most were uh, not particularly interesting that we're not gonna go over, but there's three that we're gonna talk uh, briefly about, economic and community development, committee of the whole and ordinance and rules. Um, we'll start chronologically um, with economic and community development. There was a lengthy discussion, 52 minutes on rats in the city. Um, this was, we've talked about this before, but um, the city is looking at ways to combat the rat problem in the city, which everyone knows is a problem, uh, particularly on the south side. Uh, James uh, talks about this frequently in, in our personal life. Um, and and Kathy Ann Harris uh, brings it forward. Um, I, I wanna be clear that when this came on in the debrief, when we talked about it on the debrief uh, the first time, when it, the, the, I, I was pretty negative about it. I said that I didn't think it would really come to anything. It didn't feel like a resolution that would um, have any teeth to it. Well, it didn't have any teeth to it. I didn't think that it would come to anything because it didn't, it wasn't laid out in a way that I thought was conducive to any change. This conversation, uh, just uh, in, for the sake of transparency, I thought went pretty well. Um, she brought in, uh, uh, head of the DPW, Mike Chasen, uh, a few representatives from the health department, um, and then one other one I already forget, uh, and just talking about how they feeling about the rap problem and solutions that they think uh, are viable. And in the end, she made a request to come up uh, for them to come up with a plan uh, or plans to alleviate the, the rat problem. And uh, to be clear, I haven't talked about this yet, and looking at different ways of um, killing rats uh, because rodenticide um, is very harmful to the, um, to all animals, not just rats. Um, anecdotally, uh, we talked about the fernal uh, tour um, that happened um, a couple weeks ago. And we had a friend that said on that walking tour, they found a barn owl just like dead on the on the side of the road. And so it was clearly a example of redenticide um, killing local wildlife. Uh, so it's kind of scary to see that. Um, also, based on the location, one of the things that they had mentioned was that uh, the redenticide was actually more likely killing wildlife in like the suburb areas where its homeowners is applying it. Because mm. in the urban areas, they tend to put it in the boxes where instead of yeah. an animal getting the poison directly the it's the animal eating something that's eating the poison where they get a lower dose yeah which i guess that makes sense that it would happen up there i guess yeah yeah, yeah. the one of the one of the things that was interesting was that uh the they were talking about how they uh send out notices for people who put out the trash early but also mm -hmm. like you know not not within containers and stuff yeah, And I think O'Brien was, of all people, was mentioning to the, the person that they should probably focus on enforcement of people leaving the trash out, not in containers, rather than leaving it out slightly earlier or later, because it's not like the, if it's inside a container, the, the problem's not really there. And it was yeah. nice that they had been, were bringing up uh, switching to using containers for trash the same way we have for recycling. What was interesting there was that the downside to that is that apparently currently in Waltham, you could just toss out like any kind of appliance and they'll just take it and except mattress, yeah. except mattresses i've had a mattress just on the side of my curb for a week now someone just like left it there and it's just been there uh, apparently apparently again apparently that's a they'll get to it eventually thing um but uh, anecdotally it seems like they're not getting that one also to be clear not my mattress someone just left it there and i have no idea <laughs> to where be clear from. James did not put the mattress out. Yeah, no, it's just there. It's it's just precariously hanging out, out by the side of the road. The, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, they they'll talk about trash forever, but it's just like, are you going to provide the trash cans that with the nice lids that don't blow off and keep the squirrels and the rats out? Yes, that would yeah. be nice. Yeah, um, and and so, I think that people are more inclined to use them if it's just provided, and that they don't have to rely on the landlord deciding to spend money to furnish them with a trash bin. 
but doesn't yeah. have a hole in it. And so it's the they acknowledge too that it's 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 difficult to find people for this kind of stuff and it's difficult to get them to comply. Um, and so really I'm hoping to that we look at other cities and see what they've done and um, and there was talk that they that that is what they were doing. Um, interesting facts is that uh, about 40 calls a week to different uh, partners uh, around the city around rats um, and uh, and yeah, as, as James mentioned, um, they mostly give out fines for, uh, what was it? Yeah, someone's job that is on Sunday to hand out one of around 20 fines or notices to stop putting your trash out early. Um, like that is the main deterrent for them. I wouldn't say me. Um, and and, and they, Kathy and Harris asking them about how, what they would, what resources they would need to do more enforcement. Yeah. Which honestly just strikes me as like a very strange approach to take to a problem like this. But it's, it, um, I guess you're coming at it from all angles, but still like it just, if you just give people the equipment, they will, they'll use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see what happened. Um, one of the health department people, uh, I think Mr. Crianti, I forget if it's Bill or or that's the son or that's the, I forget which which Crianti it is, um, was saying that he would be interested in exploring the idea of Waltham trash not uh, taking trash that's not in a barrel. That if you have bags uh, on the ground. Uh, then the trash would not pick it up, and but it's like that sounds like a good idea. But like with this mattress thing, people just won't do anything. Like you, you ever? And been, they'll be mad like, that there's trash piling up. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they want to be put in that position. As soon as it's like outside of your house, like that's just not your trash anymore. Like it's like you mentally like distance yourself from that trash. Um, uh, but I'm curious if they're going to do that. Also, the uh, an idea was to pick up trash on Moody Street twice a week, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and, and Jonathan Paz, uh, the Ward 9 city councilor, seemed to be into the idea as well. Um, or at least when, at least more recurring, I wouldn't say that he was gung-ho about the twice a week thing, but like when Moody Street shuts down uh, again, if they do, uh, acknowledging that there's more trash there and then changing up what they're doing. Um, Committee of the Whole, uh, we thought was going to be more interesting because the RFPs for the farm and 92 Felton Street were there. I'm curious about both of these RFPs. I'm very curious about 92 Felton. I'm very curious about Beaver Street. Um, but at the time of the meeting, the RFPs were not released, which is strange because I think the city thought that it was going to be. Uh, the city council wasn't really uh, deterred, though. They didn't seem like they really cared. I mean, the docket item is there when the RFPs are there. They just tabled it. And so in two weeks, if, when, if the RFPs are released, they will talk about it again. They'll bring it off the table. And so we're right on the cusp of these things. Um, probably in two weeks' time during our debrief, we'll be talking about those RFPs and uh, what it looks like. Hopefully, we can have some interesting people on to talk about that. Um, something interesting that did happen um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about was George Darcy um, took off the table the uh, 240 Beaver Street uh, resolution from December 12th. Um, if you recall, uh, around that same time during our debrief, we talked about how there was a heated discussion on the farm and George Darcy uh, attempted to implement a uh, or schedule a community input hearing. Um, which would allow the residents to talk about Beaver Street um, and what they would like to see for the farm. And now we acknowledge that and the city did it. They voted on it and approved it. And they said we were going to do this. Um, but nobody talked about it since then. We haven't really mentioned it either. Um, but George brought this up and said, hey, just so you know, like we approved a citizen input hearing for this before the end of March. It's now February if you could just do your due diligence. He wasn't looking for a vote. He was just like, could you just do your due diligence and do this? Kathleen McMiniman, um, city council president, uh, took issue with it, um, having a semi-long-winded uh, response that she usually does, um, saying that she thinks it's at an appropriate time. Um, she went on to say that 
you know, these RFPs are about to go out and is George insinuating that he wants to wait for the citizen vote hearing before the RFPs come out, which is not what he said. Um, and so that would just be slowing down the farm. Uh, and John McLaughlin, uh, the acting um, chair of that committee, uh, agreed with Kathleen and, and basically said it was an inappropriate time to be talking about this. And, and that was the end. George tabled it and the, you know, he wasn't looking for a vote. He was looking for confirmation that they were going to do it. And there wasn't really a confirmation of this thing that the city council voted on and approved um, was going to happen. And so disappointing, and especially because if, if it's Kathleen's concern that it's an inappropriate time, why didn't they do it last month? Why didn't they do it beginning of January? Why is it that only now that the RFPs are out now, it's an inappropriate time to be talking about them? We could have had the input session two weeks ago. Um, and so I think trying to say that they're not going to do it because it's holding up the farm is disingenuous. Um, and so I would say we're going to keep an eye on it, but I truly believe that that's just not going to happen. Maybe they'll tie it into the master plan committee thing, final session, if I was thinking in a city council way. Uh, the final committee was the ordinance and rules, and I think James, uh, who watched it and I did not, um, has a couple anecdotes to share from that as well. Uh, some foreshadowing, I guess, is that they, one of the requests was to get single family zoning defined by the law department for the purpose of uh, enforcement, which I think is that single family uh, uh, zoning resolution probably going to be showing up. And that's the, again, to highlight the problem, it's that uh, university housing is spilling out into sort of the surrounding housing and single family uh zoned areas tend to have a different environment and have been complaining about having essentially like dorms on their in their in their backyards mm -hmm. and part of the problem is that these um institutions have not been constructing enough housing for their existing uh students mm -hmm. and that that housing needs to be something that they can actually afford to because yeah they, otherwise they're just going to be going towards cheaper which is again what happens when you have the market solution getting applied to everything yeah nobody's building enough housing we just talked about waltham building out enough housing for its residents brandeis isn't building enough housing for its students because no housing is being built and so this know. is the contradiction of like the suburban sort of car oriented mindset just except for like housing instead of this but it's the whole idea of like like a, the, the suburbs is that it's the, it is car oriented but also anti like traffic so you've got all these cul-de-sacs and things that discourage like traffic through it but then like you want to externalize the problem that, of traffic so that, that turns into highways through where other people live and the, the suburbs are like the traffic generators that head towards destinations which you know are where like you know restaurants supermarkets things like that and just to sort of tie some of that back to what was being discussed in the MBTA communities thing we were talking about. But like a lot of this is just about saying that you need to zone stuff so that it makes sense from a transit oriented development sort of mindset. And it's just fascinating to watch our city council professing to be doing everything that they can about it, but then at the same time moving forward with stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Also showing up were uh, pot shops again and some of those the floor holdings among others re coming back to the process or moving moving forward with the process uh one of the other sort of remaining things was the uh spending of arpa funds on uh some of the city uh, employees and that was sort of talked on a bit with respect to like how the the uh this is structured as like a uh, like a one-time payment to not like increase their cost of living and that this is sort of coming from like arpa funds which is like the covid relief money so cities have this wait. pot of money to spend for a limited amount of things wait james so oh. uh like i said i didn't watch this meeting i know that the city is arpa funds to pay the teachers and firefighters in their contract are we talking about yeah. something else as well no that's the adoption of compensation ordinance amendment for non-union employees 
So it's using ARPA funds that they'd already agreed to spend on teachers and firefighters for all non-union employees as well. And interesting, just to use it as yeah. payroll. How oh, I think they, want, they think it's to use it up, probably. Yeah, I mean, what else is there to use it for? I can't think of a single thing. There's nothing, <laughs> yeah. nothing that they can think of besides it's just like using it. Top radios, as part of their budget. <laughs> wow. Yeah, floor holdings and wealth and cannabis are the two. Okay, uh, I think that'll do it for this episode. Um, next week, we'll be going over uh, the full city council um, and we will be here to chat about it. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, James and Josh, for uh, chatting with us as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone.